Hi, I'm Raylene Taskowski, and I've talked to over 10,000 women about sex over the past decade. Welcome to the Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed podcast. Welcome to Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed. It's where you can get questions answered like... How long does it take the average man to orgasm? And... How long does it take the average woman to orgasm? And also... Why is it so hot in here? Audiences agree. It's brilliantly funny. Raylene makes sex ed fun. This show is entertaining, factual, and relatable. There's nothing worse than being halfway done with sex and feeling your vagina shut down on you. (laughs) You've got to see stand-up comedy sex ed. I am ready to go do that comedy show. (laughs) Welcome to the Stand-Up Comedy Sex Ed podcast, hosted by Raylene Taskowski and some other guy, girl, guest, or guru. And today, I have a guest guru girl who uh, has her own podcast that I love, and this is Sarah Duncan, host of Salacious History. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> I totally jumped on top of you. I'm it's sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm was my fault. I didn't do it the way I said I was going to do it. I messed it up like I always do. <laughs> so I love the idea of your show and your show, because I did listen to it, and I love sex in history. And I, and I love how, as Americans, we think that everybody was well-behaved and, you know, sex has always been, I, I don't even know what to say. Spoiler alert. Yeah. And no. Right. <laughs> Not so even I close. I feel like when I'm listening to your podcast, it's like drunk history, but we're sober when we're listening to it because it's all salacious. I oh, love I love drunk history. So do I. <laughs> I want to be on drunk history someday. I know. <laughs> Whether it's a reenactor or a drunken storyteller, I want to be on it somewhere. I feel like I would make a great drunken storyteller. Yes. Or an actor. I I don't know. Especially since I wouldn't have to use my own words because I've always wondered whether or not I can act. (laughs) I mean, I could fake an orgasm real well, but there's also, you know, no script. Yeah, that's just called being a woman. Eh. So good, so good, so good. Oh, baby. Oh, honey. So what made you decide to start a podcast about salacious history? Well, I had been doing a podcast with a friend of mine, my friend Pamela, called Motherhood on Tap. And each week we would just get together and drink an adult beverage and then talk about a particular, you know, mom topic. And it was a lot of fun, but... I was kind of looking for a different creative outlet, something I could do on my own and had been thinking about it for a while, was trying to find a good niche to get into. And another podcast I listened to, um, We Hate Movies, they made a joke on one episode about there being a show called Horny History. And I was like, (laughs) wait a minute, that's actually kind of a genius idea. So I emailed them and was like, hey, Y'all totally make this joke about there being a podcast called Horny History. Do you mind if I take that and run with it? And they're like, go for it. You know, we're not going to do anything with it. So I I changed it up and I changed the name to Salacious History because I've always been interested by sort of like the pop culture aspect of history of, you know, like, did you ever watch those um, VH1 shows? Like, I love the 80s and I love the 90s. Yes. Every one of them. Yes. So that basically that aspect of like all history, I've always found really interesting. So I'm like, okay, you know, so I won't be trying to compete with all these other big history podcasts, like stuff you missed in history class and things like that. But I'll have my very specific kind of sexy, scandalous niche that I can be in. Right. Because um, I'm, I am a very creative person, but I like to have kind of boundaries on things like when stuff is open-ended, I'm almost like freaked oh, girl, out. <laughs> yeah. So by having that, that aspect of stuff that's either rem- ref- of who, I swear I'm not drinking, but I can't talk. <laughs> um, stuff that's either related to sex or romance or just people who like couldn't keep it in their pants. Like it gives me a launching point for any given episode. And it kind of helps me to narrow down and, you know, just find something to dig into. And it's stuff that I happen to find, incredibly fascinating because it really is true that everything goes back to sex it it impacts our relationships it impacts um power structures politics um reasons why people migrate it it's everywhere and it's just such a fascinating launch point and i've really enjoyed working on it for um 
just over a year now. I've done two 10 episode seasons and recently have done three mini soats on different aspects of the coronavirus. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's going to be history someday. Yeah, that that was a, a departure for me of going into of like, okay, I feel like history is unfolding right now. So <laughs> let's let's do some some little live action reporting. So I did one episode on basically it's all about the quarantine aspect, but uh, COVID nineteen and dating, COVID nineteen and marriage, and I just released one yesterday on COVID nineteen and domestic violence. Ah, yeah, so, I you know, see a, that. A, a barrel of laughs that last one I'm sure <laughs> I uh I was thinking my daughter and I and my husband were walking last week and I said um you know people are concerned that there's going to be like a baby boom after mm-hmm. this and I said I wonder if it's going to offset the number of people who are not getting pregnant right now from one night stands and hookups because there's no club action going on right now. True. I hadn't thought about that part of it. Like, so I wonder if there might be a baby boom, but it's probably going to be people who are already in established relationships because you're stuck with each other versus True. going to the club, getting drunk, cooking up, getting pregnant. So I would imagine right now uh, the abortion rate's probably a lot lower, mm-hmm. um, at least, you know, for the people who are not in long-term relationships, even though <laughs> some of those people thought might about be that, like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> That's a really good point. I'll have to look into that. I know. I just, I was thinking about it. I'm like, I wonder if there's an offset. Mm-hmm. And it might Are we going to break even? Yeah. Is there, yeah. Is there going to be a break even point? And <laughs> oh, probably a lot of people wouldn't think about that. But I did have a period of time in the 80s where I was fairly promiscuous. And, uh, and I did have to make one of those decisions from a, a short term relationship. Mm-hmm. I just listened to to episode one of your show earlier today. And I, I just remember you ending the episode with like, and that's what I had to make the decision in your words to be not so slutty and right. start making some different decisions. I'm like, Oh, girl. Yeah. You harsh least, on yourself. Or at least be, you know, like, get it was basically a get your shit together moment. I was like, yeah. What do you want? Right. And uh, I remember this one actually more has to do with weed than sex. But I, I did. <laughs> Back in the day, I smoked a lot of weed, like way back. But now I have an edible every now and again, but Mm -hmm. it stopped being part of my life a while ago. But one of my daughter's friends uh, was um, uh, having, I'm not saying a problem. I don't really think of weed as a problem, but her parents thought it was a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, the mom had come over one time and we were chatting and and I said, I mean, weed's not bit, that big a deal. I smoked a lot of weed and look at me. And I'm like, oh, wait, I mean, I guess you could take that either way. Like, <laughs> I mean, I didn't get a degree and I, and I don't, I'm not the CEO of a major company, but I've done pretty good for myself. Yeah, you know? I'm not living under a bridge. I'm so. not under a bridge. It was not a gateway drug. Um, you know, my kids are all amazing. So say what you want about people who, who smoke. My kids all came out great. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I stopped when the baby was, the, my youngest was two and now she's 21. So it's been a while mm-hmm. since it was part of my life, but you can't judge everybody's whole life by what they do when they're 18. Exactly. You know, it's part of salacious history. I have a much more yes. salacious history than people think, <laughs> which is why I shouldn't have made a podcast because I can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> well, see, that's the ironic thing about me is, um, I'm, I've actually been a prude for a big portion of my life. So I don't know if this is me just swinging the pendulum way the other direction or what, but. That's so funny. Yeah. Because before I started doing the direct sales company, I was a major, major prude, major mm-hmm. prude. And I went from major prude to number one in my region for 10 years straight. Mm-hmm. And, and before that I had not owned anything. Like I was, I didn't, that stuff was not for me. I didn't want any of to do with it. And then I, and then I just got latched onto it. And then I'm like, and I'm still sort of a prude. I mean, I'm not in everything, but I also at this point, just, you know, at some point decided, Hey, I'm not in your bedroom. So I don't give a shit. Exactly. <laughs> and none of your business. None of your business. What I do none is none of my business. business. What you do. And I don't care. <laughs> so what is the most, um, random thing you discovered that made you go, Oh, <laughs> like oh, when it comes shoot. to history is there anyone where you're just straight up where it's like mm, those people are bad 
Oh, that's everywhere. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that's basically, that. that is the main thing. You're like, oh, everyone sucks. Yeah. Because even, even people like you t- learned about in elementary school, like these, you know, you know, great American forefathers and all that kind of stuff, like, oh, <laughs> you're dicks. Right. Yeah. Just, I was, oh. so I was just listening to your one on the, on the wild, wild west. And, mm-hmm. um, I am also in the process of watching slash reading the Outlander series. Ah. And have you watched it at all? Just bits and pieces. That's one of the shows that's been on my list for a while. Yeah, I'm I'm reading it concurrently with the books. I kind of tend to do that. And mm-hmm. they have a lot of scenes in France of the French parlor rooms. And you mm. talk about it in your your um your podcast. And I thought it yeah. was funny because Everybody thinks vibrators and dildos are new, but Mm-mm. they had them in the 17, 1700s. Like, they've been around a really, really long time. Um, yeah, sex toys are not new things. No. No, at this point, people are like, well, they've always had vibrators. Well, like, no, they didn't have vibrators until they got electricity. Uh, but, you know, they always had dildos. And go wind up my vibrator. <laughs> Do you imagine like one of those wind up toys? You let it go. <laughs> Winding up for the 100th time in a row. <laughs> That's where the carpal tunnel would come in. Oh gosh. Yeah, I want. Yeah, that's. I got sex toy elbow. <laughs> yeah. Carpal tunnel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm. <laughs> where was i uh yeah so anyway even in the in outlander in the parlor rooms they have their the dildos and they're talking about them and i'm like we we know that they've always been around mm-hmm. and then i read somewhere that they weren't actually even frowned upon until they started using them in porn and i mean they used to be in sears and robot sears catalogs as you know really yeah massagers and i don't remember what else they called them but they were vibrators and yeah. until they started using them in porn, and then they became naughty. And then it wasn't for the proper people. But Yeah, that is that is another thing that you see over and over again of, you know, how, you know, it's really easy to assume that the way we look at sex and love and relationships now is how it's always been. But that's not true in so many different ways. Because, I mean, just look at, you know, they go through periods of history where, you know, you know, oh, yeah, it was people would have like orgies all the time. And, you know, they would have all these different lovers of, you know, same sex, different sex, everything. And then you see how over time we go through different periods where the we become more prudish for some reason or we become more buttoned up or, again, going back to the Wild Wild West episode where, you know, the the lady of the day would, that you would hold up on a pedestal was one who was just, you know, basically just completely sex, sexless, buttoned up, no makeup, you know, was, you, you were meant to be, you know, the, the pure chaste caregiver and anything less than that, then you were just like an untouchable human being. It's like, why? Like, yeah. why did we make this, this decision that, you know, anything having to do with sexuality is just a bad thing in and of itself. I know the answer. (laughs) Me, 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 pick me. I know the answer. It's where, it's wherever um, the church has popped up. Oh yeah. And this is, and this is from coming from someone who grew grew up in the church and still goes to church, but yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I grew up in the church. Uh, uh, A lot of my episodes come back to the church. Um, because I always wind up bringing it up, but I remember I was in Hawaii and and they had done a uh, a luau, mm-hmm. and they were talking about the history of Hawaii and how you know the they had the um, the wild, reckless, violent shaking of the hips and you know like the you know when you're picturing uh, belly dance not belly dancers hula dancers hula dancers yeah the wild and the fire and the you know like it the excitement. And then the religion came in and they said, well, that's just wrong. And then they started making them more longer glass skirts and, and then the dancing became less fiery and, and fun and became more, you know, romanticized and subtle. Mm -hmm. And then it went back and now it's a combination of the two. But I remember watching it and thinking that was, that was really, really interesting. But, and it was because the church came to the Island and the church said that Mm -hmm. what they were doing was, you know, too I don't know the word purify or yeah 
It just wasn't of God. We are here to throw a wet blanket over your whole setup. Exactly. And as I'm list, like when I read books and they don't, I like historical fiction. So I'm aware that it's fiction, but I, I and I, my husband has said the other day, well, it's fiction. I'm like, the story within the story is fiction. The historical part is the part where this is the shit that really did happen back then. Yeah, the context is real. The context is real. And that's kind of how I want to learn my history. Or like you're doing, the salacious history. Do it like that. Drunk Mm -hmm. history, do it like that. Oh, hell yes. (laughs) Right. I want to learn, but I want to be entertained at the same time. And so when they're talking about the the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, because we are talking about England, Ireland, and Scotland, and, and the Lutheran Church, and all the churches, and how they were literally the battle of everything wasn't Mm -hmm. necessarily the people it was it was you know like the the catholic uh king and then there was the protestant king Mm -hmm. and that's where the fight was the fight was always about religion oh yeah oh i can actually go back and answer your earlier question now about if have i read anything that was just like what i remember i was doing a, a sex and marriage episode on the tudor period in england and you know just like you said the church had their hands in everything, including people's sex lives. And they had all these rules around certain days of the year that you could not have sex. And it was like, you know, certain number of days, you know, uh, after a woman was pregnant, um, no, never while she's menstruating, never on certain holidays, um, you know, not while someone's pregnant. And like, you just add this entire list up and you're like, at least like three days of the year for sex. <laughs> like how in the hell is this supposed to work? Right. How did anybody get pregnant? Exactly. Oh, wait, because they ignored it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm just, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised when I'm looking back, even knowing the damage the church still causes, knowing how much, not the church, religion. We'll say religion. religion. Exactly. How religion has damaged so many people in so many parts of our history and how much stuff had to get hidden because, you know, you would be afraid. Mm-hmm. I'm working on an episode right now, because um, for season three, uh, my next upcoming season, I want to do an entire season on uh, LGBTQ history. And the first episode I'm working on is actually uh, gay survivors of the Holocaust. Oh. And how their story has sort of been whitewashed from history, because sort of that same thing, they they wanted to hold all holocaust survivors up as being these very you know white virtuous heterosexual individuals and they did not fit that mold and so their story was shoved to the side and not told for a very very long time i think that's um that's another that's another thing that still it gets to me every now and then because like even in this book that i'm reading and there have been gay people throughout all of the history. Oh, yeah. And people say there's more gay people now. Well, that's because there's more actual people now. I, I, I would venture the guess that the percentage it, of people who are, I, I would bet that the percentage is the exact same, but it's the percentage of people who can actually be open now is higher. Exactly. They're not having to hide in order to not, not get killed. killed or arrested <laughs> or harassed. Right. So that's, be, that, let's be honest, they're still harassed. But. Right. That's true. But it's certainly more open now than it was er, earlier in the century. Absolutely. And my, my sister is gay, actually, and her wife is amazing. And they have a little boy. And it's one of the most beautiful, loving families I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Again, don't have a problem with it. And I know it bothers certain people in my family, but I still believe that there's no way God put us on this earth and said, there's only one way to love. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you all this capacity for love and enjoyment and wonder and attraction, but the only proper way to do it is this way. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the thing I've come to realize about sexuality too. And just being a sexual being is, you know, it, enjoying your body in and of itself is not a bad thing. And, right. you know, as, as a, Good little christian girl who grew up in the south you know there's so much you know shame and that kind of thing that surrounds uh 
how we're raised and how we're taught about sex, if we're taught about sex at all. Right. And <laughs> just, it's, it was so weird when I got married. Cause I actually, I was a virgin bride. I've only ever been with um, my husband and hmm, side note, super sexy. And <laughs> <laughs> hi, sweetie. And, um, it was weird because even when I was then in a context when I was, you know, quote unquote, allowed to have sex, it's not like that part of your brain where all the shame lives just suddenly turns off. It's like this yeah. weird transition period of like, okay, I think I'm allowed to be doing this, but right. then I've been- The Madonna was, horror complex. Exactly. It's yeah. just, blah. I'm like, it's such a mind F. Right. I actually have talked about that um, probably on my last two that haven't been posted yet. Um, uh -huh. that it has come up, the Madonna horror complex. And then uh, past that is Crone. And mm -hmm. there's there's sex and shame that go in each one of those things and how we have to navigate it. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious, how long did you date your husband before you got married? Uh, four years, two of which were long distance. Wow. Good job. <laughs> and I... Whew, there, I admit there were moments where he had to like throw me off him because I told him when we first started dating like like hey I haven't had sex I plan on being married before I have sex are you okay with that and he's like yeah and, but then like I said he's really hot so yeah. <laughs> there are times where I was prepared to throw it out the window and he was like all right bye and run away but yeah it's it was interesting an interesting dynamic because he had had sex before we got together but he went through four years of blue balls before we got married. And That's so yeah. sweet. He did. I was, he's, he's an absolute sweetheart. The reason I ask is because I know, I mean, just off the top of my head, I know four separate girls who were saving themselves for marriage, uh, who got married very, very young, mm -hmm. very, very quickly, and then got divorced very young and very quickly because they just yeah. wanted to have sex. And mm -hmm. it, the church, you know, their family had you know, it, it was against their rules yeah. and they, they wanted to stay within. And of the four girls that I'm thinking of, only one is still married and she's been married for a while, but mm -hmm. I, I think they dated for a while too. So yeah. it was right after she turned 18, but I think they had started dating a little bit earlier. Yeah. We met when we were 21 and we got married when we were 25. Yeah. So I was just curious about it. Cause I, yeah. I just, it's, I, <sighs> I, don't know, I was pretty open with my daughters where it was like, I am not going to hold you to an unrealistic expectation that I nowhere near came close to achieving. Mm -hmm. I know my mom didn't, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not going to set you up for that kind of failure. But what I did say is, you know, when you're ready and you're doing it because you want to, and not because you're being pressured and mm -hmm. you are protected emotionally and physically you don't have to tell me about it. You don't have to ask yeah. my permission. Um, but two of my daughters required a surgery, which I will be covering on one of my podcasts mm -hmm. um, because they had uh, what her, the doctor called it a nearly impenetrable hymen, but it does have other, other terms. But mm -hmm. basically what it means is you can't break the hymen. It's, it's solid as a rock. It's only got a hole in it big enough to let men seeds out and it's not ever going to break. And oh. it was two of my girls, my, one of my cousins and my daughter's college roommate all had mm -hmm. this issue. And it's not an issue that until I heard my, till I had it with my kids, I ever knew was it was an issue. Like, and so that's another reason we have to talk about sex and I forget even why I brought that up. Oh yeah. Because when we found out uh, the issue, the doctor said, she's going to have to have surgery. So I know four girls who have had their, their hymen surgically opened mm -hmm. because it wasn't naturally going to open during penetration. Yeah. So uh, she said, I can do it. I told the doctor said we can do it whenever. And she was 17, I think at the time. And I said, well, do you want to have the surgery now? Or do you want to wait until later where you have to say, I want the surgery. And then I know that you're planning on having sex. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And she goes, I'll just go ahead and have that surgery now. And I'm like, good point. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but that's totally true. <laughs> I was like, we can, we can delay it. But then when it happens, I'm going to be like, oh, this bitch is trying to have sex. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So um, both of my daughters, as soon as we realized it was a problem, they had the surgery. But um, 
I can't wait to have that episode. I have to find a doctor I can talk to about that one. Oh, funny story. My mother is actually a retired OBGYN. Oh, well, ask her if she'll talk to me about it. And if she's heard of it. I'm sure she's heard of it. She's an OBGYN. Oh, yeah. um, I'll say, I'll, I'll say I'll, she's, she's definitely a, she might be a little bit of a prudy, waspy individual, but I will ask her if she has recommendations. That's a good idea. For that, yes. I should throw that out in my, uh, on my friends list too and find one. Because mm-hmm. I have lots of questions about the vagina in general, but that's one I would love to talk about. Because I think if I personally know four people that have it, at first I thought it must just be something in our bloodline because it was my cousin and then two of my daughters. Mm-hmm. And but then when my my youngest daughter says she knows two other friends who have had this surgery, so now I'm like, okay, so that makes four that I know, five that I've heard of. Mm-hmm. This has to be a lot more common than one would think and so then we should talk about it Mm -hmm. and as you're saying that i'm i'm thinking back in my head to you know the first week or so that i was having sex which you know i've been told that it's kind of painful at the beginning but i was really having some pain at the beginning so i'm wondering if i might have had some physical things going on that i was not quite aware of yeah where it wasn't just a thin flap Mm-hmm. you know but yours might have been a little thicker yeah so it's I don't remember it's been a really 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 long time for me I don't remember <laughs> but it's good now right oh yeah all right oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> I do like talking about sex um where are you getting your uh ideas and doing your research uh the short answer is a whole lot of Googling. The longer answer is I have um, in my Google Docs about a 15 page document that's just a giant list of episode topic ideas. So I've been trying to get a lot of ideas and inspiration just from all periods of history. It's really easy to kind of get a little bit of bias toward more modern events, especially when you get to like the 1960s and onward, because there was, you know, a lot of well-documented sexual revolution happening Mm -hmm. then and that kind of thing. But, you know, I'm trying to find stuff all the way back to, you know, BCE and everything like that. But um, I really just, I search for stuff that A, sounds interesting. I'm like, ooh, I want to learn more about that. And also that there are sources available for which is sometimes the limiting factor. Because if you find something that's really interesting, but there are only two uh, one paragraph articles about it, that's not really enough to do an entire episode's worth on. Right, I agree. But I, do, I saw some interesting stuff in there. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. I, I'm, it's weird, because like I'm a nerd for history, but only in the right context. Like. Mm -hmm. My husband read 1776 and I was like three pages in. I was like, nope. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Just sum up. Sum up and only tell me the dirty bits. (laughs) Exactly. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm a good filter for the, for these kinds of topics because I have a notoriously short attention span. So if it doesn't hold my attention, I don't expect it to hold anyone else's. Right. And so like, okay, I find this interesting. And if it's good enough that I am willing to dig into it and, you know, talk about it for 25 minutes straight on a particular episode, then I'm like, all right, we might be onto something here. I think none of my daughters like history, but we all like drunk history. So yes. they did a good job. Whoever's idea that was, it was a great idea. Mm-hmm. I'll say thank you, Derek Waters and whoever helped you develop that. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's, it's a really smart idea. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I'm I'm watching like at first I thought they were taking actual historians and getting them drunk and then I was just like no wait that's an actor that's like like wait a minute that's that's Paget Brewster from, I've seen her on like five different TV shows exactly that's that's that guy from that show that I watched so all they do is give them the history make them memorize them and get them drunk I can do that <laughs> do you have a favorite drug history episode or story. No, I like, I, I like a lot of them. I mean, mm-hmm. I just, I've learned so much. I like the ones that stand out, the, the Mary Shelley Frankenstein one. Yes. Um, 
the Hamilton one. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. There's just so many, so many. I the love the Lewis and Clark one too. Oh. It's fantastic. I don't know if I remember that, but the Mona Lisa, it's weird because I learned oh, shit. Like yes. the only reason Mona Lisa is famous is because she got stolen and, or something like that. Yeah. And, then, and it wasn't, wasn't really stolen. The Italian guy. And I'm just like, I didn't know any of that stuff, but that was hysterical. Exactly. And then the acting. What, when, they're, <laughs> when they're acting them out and then the drunk person burps and they burp along <laughs> with them. Yes. I die. <laughs> When then the guy playing John idea. Wilkes Booth jumps off the the balcony, lands on the stage, and goes, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> <laughs> like it's so wrong, but it's so funny. And I think in every single episode, somebody goes, "I'm gonna puke." <laughs> <laughs> I just freaking love it. So I will probably never do a podcast about history because I'm not the kind of I. I just pose things to people. I'm like, hey, why don't you go research that? <laughs> like one of my podcasts two or, two or three episodes ago she's actually a, a researcher and i'm like here's an idea <laughs> here's a question and and she's like well what is that? i'm like i don't know i i just know that's the answer you can figure out how how that's the answer <laughs> cool i'll just talk about it so um all right so i do like to wrap up all of my unless you have something more fun to talk about sex do you have any more sex stuff you want to talk about oh uh, the short answer is yes but of course, whenever whenever I'm asked a question, the mind goes blank. Right, because I have always. quarantine brain right now. I have quarantine brain, quarantine Although, ass. I will, quarantine I will say, oh, gosh, <laughs> everything. It's a whole physical condition. Right. I will say, um, actually, I've, I'm in very much of a sexual sexual dry spell right now because my husband and I are both working from home, but. We, um, my day job is I actually work for a pharmaceutical company that makes uh, insulin for diabetics. And he also works for that company. And he has to actually go in and work on the production lines. And I work from home, but we had two young kids. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to get anything done if mm -hmm. I'm trying to run around with them. So the kids and I have actually been living at my parents' place. I'm in their guest room right now for the past two months. That explains a lot. And he comes in on the weekends. So Mama ain't got, hasn't had any sex for like two or three months now. And right before that, I was pregnant and had given birth and was recovering from being pregnant. So I'm just like, Aww. like well, I'm Matt, a big fan when we're finally alone, I'm going to jump on you so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Did your church, church teach you about masturbating? Because that's how I survive everything. Well, let me, let me tell you, because that is something that I have begun a foray into in the last few years because again sheltered individual did not really know that was an option for a long time like that's a thing girls can do that's awesome but i'm one of those people and quietly who, without mess <laughs> yeah but the thing is you see so many sources that just say you know hey go go explore go masturbate go. i'm like okay how it's yeah. been so much of just like poking around down there and trying to trying to figure out what is happening so I'm definitely one of those people who is like, okay, I'm, I'm at the point in some areas where I really should have been as like a teenager of like, okay, this is when I should have been learning and exploring about these things. So. All right. Well, when we're not being recorded, I'll give you a primer <laughs> as soon as we get off. Here Fantastic. I, Although I will say, I forget the name of the website off, off top That's of my That's a clitoris, eye. so you know. <laughs> oh, hey. I have a 3D clitoris that I keep right here on my desk. It's useful. <laughs> but it I, forget, I forget what it's called, but there's a website that has really amazing, like, how-to videos for women, and it is spectacular. Yeah. It's mostly about finding the right spot yeah. and the right thought at the same time. Exactly. So for women, it is very, very mental. And mm -hmm. so you can't just sit there and be like, I'm touching myself. I'm touching myself. I'm touching like, myself. Nothing's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more like, um, and then he throws me up against the wall. <laughs> you gotta oh, go girl. somewhere. And, you gotta make a thing. You do. You start somewhere and let your brain And then the wander. chimney sweep comes in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't have enough to pay. Welcome to a spit off podcast where we just where we just uh, improv uh, romance novels as we go through. Oh my god, that would be epic. <laughs> 
that would be i actually thought of doing um one of my uh in my comedy thing i was going to do and i never really sat down to flesh it out mm -hmm. was uh the thought process that it takes to get a woman from a to b of mm -hmm. trying to have the orgasm but like I would go through and say, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then that guy, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then, and then I had the biggest orgasm I ever had in my life, and then I rolled over and went, and, you know, and then, and then, and then <laughs> I tell them after the fact that it was just a fantasy, none of that shit happened, but that's how I had to get there. Right? That's but fantastic. It would, it would just take so much to just build it in such a way, and maybe I will someday, but I haven't, well, now anybody who heard it, they'll be like, She's going to tell us at the end, this did not happen. <laughs> a jerk. <laughs> but it was, it was funny. I come up with a lot of my bits while I'm laying down trying to fall asleep. And then I forget mm -hmm. them when I wake up in the morning and I was just like, that's going to be hilarious. Or sometimes I'll wake up and I'll write a little note. I'll write a note. Cause I think it will remind me of, mm -hmm. you know, like what I, what I'm supposed to remember. Like here's one. It says call it, uh, generous he's so generous so apparently i wrote a joke about that in my head and i don't i don't know what it is but but i bet it was great yeah i think it was something about how we always give guys credit for being generous when all they did was allow us to have an orgasm which should be step one exactly right? it's like the dads that you see at the grocery store with all their kids and people are like oh that's so great they could do this i'm like that's parenting. every other mother does this all the time this right. is just called parenting right yeah so he's so generous he's such a generous lover you know what so are these two fingers <laughs> i'm sorry that was <laughs> yes okay i went too far <laughs> it's fantastic well that's why it's called stand-up comedy sex head so we talk a little about sex and hopefully it makes some people laugh always okay. So I have this game that I play at the end. It's things they don't teach you in school. A crazy mm -hmm. mix of fun facts, random trivia, totally useless knowledge. So our weird sex question of the week. And this is actually very on point. Mm -hmm. What percentage of sex toys are made in China? 70? Mm. Exactly. 70%. <gasps> if you oh! answer between 65 and 75%, you are correct. But it has really not the smack in my business because even if i want to pivot and do stuff online we're out of stock <laughs> that's crazy China. <laughs> yeah and that's something i actually when i was doing my uh dating uh episode research a few weeks ago i found that a lot of uh personal sex toys had like sales really went through the roof in the first few yeah. weeks of quarantine because people are like Okay, yeah. I gotta scratch the itch somehow. That's that's what I do, and it did. It went through the roof, and mm -hmm. then we started running out of stuff. So, like when I like now, if I want to do a virtual party, and I can do virtual parties, and I talk about the the lubes and the lotions and the whatever, and then mm -hmm. I go to the website ahead of time to see what what do I show personally mm -hmm. that I have in stock as a demo that's available, and almost every th single thing that I currently show is currently on back order. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, it, what do I do? I, I, do I so buy? you're going to go into your kitchen. You're going to get this big wooden spoon. Right. Make sure it's smooth. Right. I just, it's like I wanted, I want, I'm thinking I might just go and buy something that is in stock mm -hmm. and then use it. Yeah. So Ooh. that, it, so that's, that's it. 20, 70% of the toys are made in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. Um, how can people find you? How can they find me? Um, my website with all of the show episodes, uh, you can find that at salacioushistory.com. And if you go there and you love it and you subscribe and you want the show to be on forever and ever, you can also go to patreon.com slash salacioushistory and help support the show because this is a labor of love, but it also costs money. So yeah. Yeah. Podcasts are not free. So you're not I learned when I decided to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Surprise. Yeah. 
You can find me on Instagram at standup comedy sex ed. You can find me at standup comedy sex ed.com. And I've set up a Facebook group just for this podcast so you can participate in polls, ask questions politely, share an alternate point of view, and generally let us know what you think of the episode. So search standup comedy sex ed podcast on Facebook. Please subscribe to this podcast and share with all of your friends. Sarah, it was really fun talking to you. I'm going to add you on Facebook now because I like you. Yay, we're going to be besties. <laughs> we'll be besties. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for, I, I, it was really fun. I love to hear about history and if it's all about sex, it's even better. So have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.